What's up, everybody? It's Mansant back at you with the lovely co-host Leviah, as always, coming at you with the first of the best of three Leviah Blitz series, where I'll be playing Leviah versus every single hero in Blitz. And this comes with a promise. I will put out every single video before Everfest drops on February 4th. So that means we're going to be sticking to about three videos per week. So a reminder that if you want to keep up with the schedule, please hit that subscribe button so you can get all the Leviah goodies coming your way. The first video I've got for you today is a best of three matchup I played against my local friend Tom on Dorinthia. And uh, it's got some really interesting playlines that open up. So with these videos, my hope is that uh, by adding commentary, going through th the thought processes, we'll be able to up everyone's Leviathan game and get us all into winning more of these matchups. So with that, I hope you all enjoy the video. Quick note to cut down on some of the editing. I did have to forego adding all the visuals for us to follow along with, but there will be commentary. And sometimes I'll be joined by uh, the players themselves to join me instead of Leviathan. So um, with that, I hope you all enjoy and uh, let's get into it. Alrighty, welcome to the gameplay portion of the best of three series here. So what we can see on screen is that critical die roll. And versus Dorinthia, what you always want as the Leviah player is the choice to go second. And I know that's a bit counterintuitive because normally Leviah wants to always go first, but the thing is against Dorinthia, they love going second because it's a free turn of just massive card tempo that they get to push um, on you because they get to do something as simple as swing with Dawnblade for three, make you overcommit cards and they will still get away with an arsenal, or perhaps push damage depending on what attack reactions they have in hand. So by denying them the ability to do that going second, um, this means that uh, the hot seat is rather on Dorinthia's side because they are in the predicament now of whether or not to swing at all on turn one versus Leviah. Because Leviah can have a significant amount of non-blocks in the deck, so it's kind of a gamble here to be able to push damage or not. Some Dorinthias go for it, some don't. Um, so we see Tom here considering what the optimal first turn for him is here. And if we peep his hand, I've got these expanded uh, zoom hand cams here. Uh, we see that he has the nourishing emptiness in hand. And for me, if I was in his position, I think this is a super safe turn one because there's no way for me to have a defense reaction in Arsenal here. And it would, con it would take me a lot of equipment to be able to deny the free intellect. So, um, you know, having played this game, I know that's actually not what Tom opts for here. He um, will choose a different line, but that is to say, you know, preliminary uh, statement here, no game is free of its misplays or questionable decisions. Uh, you'll see on my end, I make uh, quite a couple myself, but this is, you know, to put, a, put ourselves in the seat of both these players here, and see what a game of Blitz feels like, the kind of tough choices you have to make, because honestly, Blitz is a format that doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. It is uh, not as high roll as some would say. It's kind of a fundamental challenge to play Blitz format properly. It's all about managing life versus the cards in hand, and that is a huge skill to pick up for this game of flesh and blood. So what we see here is that he swung for three, which as Levia, I'm super happy to just overblock as much as I can, fill that graveyard so that I don't worry about missing the ability to fill it later in the game. Um, now, what does happen, though, is that my hand becomes really awkward. I have two Blood Rush Bellows that I drew in off the top, plus a blue, plus a red Deadwood. And the red Deadwood is ideally what you go for on a turn one like this. It's free eight damage. It doesn't require anything uh, out of graveyard. And uh, it just puts on a lot of pressure because if Dorinthia wants to keep her entire hand, she's going to eat a lot of damage or get rid of a lot of armor. So looking at my hand, that's probably the line I should have gone down. Uh, but my thought process here was that to get through Dorinthia's massive amounts of armor, I ideally want a Blood Rush turn to uh, come through, right? I want to push the damage. I want to have a huge turn. So I'm a little scared to potentially discard a Blood Rush. Um, so that makes me think my turn is better spent just swinging with Mandible Claws and setting up one of the Blood Rush for next turn. However, um, when you do swing Mandible Claws uh, on a first turn like this, you're normally pretty safe to roll scabs because you might as well try. If you hit the two action points, cool, that's two swings of your weapon because you've got the cards to pitch, right? However, I'm punished there uh, rolling a one, so this makes my clunky hand even more clunky because now I just have to, uh, I have to arsenal the Blood Rush and uh, proceed with the game state from here. So definitely a big misplay on my end because not so much that I should have thought about rolling the one really, but more that I should have just played the Red Deadwood anyway because the cool thing about having double Blood Rush is that I know I can't lose both of them. I know I will still end my turn with at least one Blood Rush in Arsenal and that's probably enough to win the game. So uh, mistake there on my end as well, starting us off in this game, but I was 
trying to play super careful about managing the amount of blood rushes in my deck. Because uh, honestly, it'd been a while since I'd played this matchup. So what we see here is that uh, Tom on the left is going to take full advantage of the fact that I just didn't threaten any cards. And he gets to now swing in with a Steel Blade Supremacy Dawnblade, which is a fantastic way to get started. But the thing is about this attack, he didn't play a go again first. So that leads me to believe that he's either holding a Glint the Quicksilver or is going to commit the Refraction Bolters. Because otherwise, why wouldn't you just play the go again here first? He even pitched the Warrior's Valor. So on my end here, what I'm reading is that he's got a hand that has some really strong attack reactions. Perhaps a Singing Steel Blade for him to even search the go again. Um, so as we look at Tom's hand, that's actually exactly what he had here. So the, the line I'm thinking about um, ends up being rewarded. So what you want to do when they come at you with a steel blade like this and it doesn't have go again, you either want them to uh, force to break the reaction, the refraction bolters really early. Um, and honestly, in this position, he hasn't even blocked it. So it'd be really good if he does that. Um, so I'm not too keen on over blocking this. I don't want to lead into him potentially getting uh, some buffs off on this card, but I also don't want to leave it just naked damage coming through, because if he does decide to buff with, by three with some other attack reaction, um, I will lose Husk, right? Because it's coming in for five, he'd buff it by three, I would take eight, go down to 12, and I'd lose Husk right off the bat. So by me throwing at least something in front of it, um, I'm not threatened by the plus three to lose Husk. Um, and by using a piece of equipment there, it means he also can't trigger any of his reprise effects. So then the choice on him becomes, does he use Refraction Bolters? And Tom just decides not to because he hasn't gotten the health value out of it, which can be pretty important in this game. So now we look at what I'm going to do in response. And one of the reasons I love Barraging Beatdown is because of a scenario like this, where I want to go for a Blood Rush play, um, but I've got too many non-sixes in hand. So you want ways to burn those cards out of hand, and the blue barraging beatdown is really good. Um, let's me burn it out, get some value, make his blocks harder, and then it also can really um, push, I mean, great damage through with the claws, because he doesn't necessarily want to block two cards on that first claw swing, which is what's inevitably going to happen. So I do go for the blood rush, and I'm looking to draw, obviously, ideally it would be a blue and a boneyard marauder, but um, don't hit it. Instead, I hit... Uh, an Eye of Ophidia and another 6. And so now my <laughs> my playline becomes probably a little too greedy here because now I'm thinking, okay, Eye of Ophidia is going to guarantee that my next Blood Rush is, hits exactly what I want. So if I lead with Claw here, I get rid of my floating resources, which can allow me to then pitch Eye of Ophidia to play Blood Rush. And then the Eye of Ophidia is going to let me opt to make sure I hit an attack in a blue. So that's the line I'm thinking about going here. Um, but the other option would have been to just pitch a blue to swing with the uh, six I had in hand. It wouldn't be an amazing Blood Rush turn, um, but I could have just held the second Blood Rush for next turn and uh, spread my threat across two turns there. But instead, we're going with that I have a Fidia line like, like I talked about. So I have a Fidia. I unfortunately see two blues, no attacks. So um, the choice then becomes, do I leave one on top, put them both on the bottom, try to dig a bit more, but I know my deck has a pretty good amount of blues, so uh, what I'd rather hit is the attack here. So I put them both on the bottom, and then I do hit the attack draw with that Hungering Slaughter Beast, but unfortunately my other card is another red, which means I do not get to swing claws into the Hungering Slaughter Beast, which is super, super unfortunate. Unfortunate. I lost seven damage on that gamble with Ivafidia, um, but that's the, that's the risk you sometimes take, but then again, if we look at how I could have played it instead... Um, this this uh, line beforehand of just pitching the Ivafidia to swing without playing the Blood Rush would be two less damage, uh, but I'd save the Blood Rush for next turn. So honestly, that was probably the better line, but of course, you can get greedy sometimes and, and hope that your eye can dig you for those right cards. Didn't in this case. So that means my turn is just coming in for 11, which is still a huge amount. Um, I knew that he didn't really want to block with cards in hand because he used his entire equipment suite on the last one. So the fact that I get even one card from hand here, um, I like quite a bit. Uh, also, we did uh, have a mistake come up there. The Arknight Skullcap should not have blocked for two, so um, didn't didn't catch that in the moment. But then uh, cards go back to Tom's hand. I'm just going to Arsenal the other card, which was a Sink Below. Those defense reactions in Arsenal are really important against Dorinthia because they can get around Reprise. And uh, so one of the reasons you run them at all is because the amount of value they can get across the entire spread of Blitz matchups is 
honestly uh, a bit immeasurable. Like in this matchup, Arsenal defense reaction is just incredible. So really happy that that's there at least. It did sacrifice seven damage on that previous turn though. So then we look at what Tom's going to do. And I think what may have happened here is that he forgot the Intimidate card comes back to hand, honestly. Um, because we look at his hand here, and his playline is probably just the Nourishing. In fact, I, I know he does end up going with the Nourishing here. Yep. But he's got that extra card in hand that's just going to do nothing. Um, so I think this was this was just uh, unfamiliarity with the Intimidate mechanic. It's a bit unfortunate that we had this come up. Um, but... The Nourishing here, of course, I have the Defense Reaction in Arsenal 4, so that is just fantastic for uh, how I don't have to commit the armor pieces here. You'll note that I did take Arknight Skullcap for this game, and that's because I wanted to try both, because we're playing a best of three, right? So you will see I switched to the Hope Merchant Sud, but I'm always a little bit unsure on whether or not to take Skullcap versus Hope Merchants. Um, it's really just a, a comfort thing, so this game I do try the Arknight Skullcap, just to have the ability to block a bit more of those weird thresholds that Dorinthia can present, just in case she has, um, you know, the Spoils of War, or uh, she's got uh, a Dawnblade counter, anything that can mess up just blocking three over. Um, so what you can see here is that the play pattern of my deck is really rewarded here, because I was able to block with two cards uh, for a total of seven, which is above the normal curve, right? Normally, uh, you're going to block for about six value. Uh, I blocked for seven. And then I get to return with two cards for nine. So in total, I've netted um, some really, really favorable uh, card trades here. Um, I do get to also hold a card to Arsenal, which is always fantastic for Leviya. Um, you don't need to just spam all your cards every turn. Setting up Arsenal is really, really important for making sure your Blood Rush turns hit. In this instance, obviously I've used both Blood Rush, but an Arsenal still never hurts. So I get a huge, huge value turn off there. Tom decides to not block it too heavily because obviously Dorinthia in a position like this when you still haven't broken Husk, I mean, you're, you're in for a tough one. Um, you need to put on a ton of pressure because at any point I can just commit Husk and make you lose your turn. Because the beautiful thing about carrying Husk, right, is that Dorinthia's attacks need to hit to actually let her use the go again on her weapon. So when you use carrying Husk, it's going to overblock normally, uh, and that just can shut down their entire turn when they lead with a Gogan attack like this. So we'll see if I use it this turn. Um, normally in this kind of position, it's it's really good because Husk is under threat of being broken anyway. So we see Tom come in with the Dawnblade for 5 go again, and he's committed the Courage of Bladehold. So especially now if I use Husk, it's actually a very good trade um, because he's committed a very crucial piece of his equipment. Uh, and if I just commit a very crucial piece of my equipment, I can I can normally deny the double value that his Courage would get. So I'm going to opt to not trigger Reprise here and just overblock that Dawnblade Swing. So now if he wants to buff it, um, he's going to have to do so without a Reprise bonus effect. So this is uh, hopefully going to put him in a pickle here, and we do see that he has a way to buff three, even though I didn't trigger a prize with that route. So now I am going to take the damage. He is going to be able to swing again with go again, uh, because Dorinthia is now letting him swing again with the, with, uh, the Dawnblade there. So this is unfortunate for what I'm looking at. Um, my play was going to be, because I don't want to block with cards here. My hand, I've got a really strong uh, ability to swing in uh, next turn and present lethal, because Tom is at 6. And that's a number that Levi can basically hit off any card. So, of course, if I can present over six, then I'm all of a sudden looking at taking probably three cards out of his hand each turn, which means Dorinthia basically can't play the game anymore. So him getting another Dawnblade swing here is not ideal, but at the same time, like I said with how life is, a Dawnblade counter is probably never getting value again in this game. So very, very comfortable with this position at the end of the turn. And uh, we did forget to uh, get out copper tokens for this game, so we just have the copper die there, representing two. Uh, I think he bumps it up to four, because he should have four, yep. So, just like I was talking about with the damage trade here, I'm going to lead with the Howl from Beyond uh, into, I believe it's going to be a Red Dread Screamer. Oh yeah. So, all, already I'm presenting nine on this attack, and it's very likely going to have Gogan. I believe I only had two misses, or maybe exactly three misses in the graveyard. 
And uh, that means I can then follow it up with a Mandible Claw Swing, presenting 12 total. So either he takes a hit down to three and blocks to three cards, or he uses some combination of equipment. Uh, but no matter what, I should be getting two cards out of his hand on this turn, unless he wants to get to Reckless Swing range. Which, of course, if he gets to Reckless Swing range, then I'm super happy. I can just stall at the game, turn off Blood Debt uh, each turn I can, and uh, eventually I'll win. I have that inevitability because I know that the Ivafidia is not next to the Reckless Swing. That's like the one thing that can mess you up. So, looking good from this position, for sure, on the Levi side. Um, while we take a second here, I do want to mention, um, this was the first game kind of working with... Uh, keeping these games high quality for the YouTube channel. So sometimes we do forget to use the tokens we were supposed to and um, put things in frame for the hand cam. But as more of these videos come out, and I mean, there's there gonna be a lot that comes out here, uh, this will all get better in time. So bear with me, this is just hero number one out of 22. Uh, so there we go. Like I said, we're getting two cards out of his hand uh, and he's still in reckless swing range. So. Turn was perfect on the Levi side. This is everything you want. Because now there's inevitability to the game. I'm no longer playing to necessarily break the 12 damage a turn mark that I need to. I'm just playing to turn off Blood Debt and find Reckless Swing. Um, in the current list, reminder it's in the description here, I am only running one Reckless Swing. Um, and honestly, that has felt really, really solid for this build. I'm surprised I wasn't at one earlier. In Classic Constructed, two feels a lot better because the deck's just so much larger. But in Blitz, you'd normally go through your deck pretty quickly, especially in Levi, you can draw so much um, with the Blood Rush. So pretty happy at one, and I believe we even see it in hand here. Oh yeah. So just doing everything perfectly, just in case, you know, for the, for the stream. Where we're going to block, he's going to react, but then look at that reaction in response. The Reckless Swing. And of course, I have only sixes in hand. And there we go. That is game one. And it was a bit of a weird one, right? Uh, the Blood Rush play was not optimal and a little bit of questionable decisions overall by the two of us. Um, but this is the beauty of getting to play Blitz in a best of three series because now you're really going to get a better breadth for what the matchup should be like rather than just one kind of high roll or misplay heavy game. So we jump into game two here. And um, as you can see, we got the, uh, the choice on Tom now. So Tom is going to choose whether to go first or second. Um, I believe he chooses to let me go first, which, um, you know, is correct in this case because he wants to do what I talked about last game where he can threaten a ton on his uh, first turn, my second turn, where potentially even a Dawn Blade can go through if I'm really greedy and don't want to block with my hand. So he puts me on the play, but I actually luck out here like crazy. If I could draw this kind of hand first turn every game, it'd be fantastic. We start with a Sigil. You love to see those early. They bank life for later. And then we lead into a red Deadwood again in that opening hand. And I get to draw a discard here. Um, and this is where I don't get everything the way I want. But there we go. Discard a red Dread Screamer. But I don't have to banish the Dread Screamer because I had that sigil in the graveyard already. So I'm trimming the graveyard already. I'm coming in for eight already. Of course, he's not going to take damage. He's going to block. But sometimes when you block, uh, when Dorinthia is blocking that heavy on turn one, you can get some really good Gogan cards out of their hand. So uh, I'm going to end Arsenal there with a sink below as well. So everything is already starting at the gate really well for me. So then we look at Tom's turn turn one here, um, where Dorinthia, of course, is ideally always going to play some Gogan effect into Dawnblade, into sitting on attack reaction, and that's exactly what we're going to see play out. Starting with that hit and run, this is going to let Tom lead in with the Dawnblade next. But the Dawnblade's only coming in for base 3, right? So if I want to do the normal pattern against Dorinthia, which is overblocking by exactly 3, it's only going to take 2 cards from my hand. And if we look at my hand, this is one of those amazing 2 card hands, where I've got an Ivafidia to pitch and an Endless Maw to play. So I'm very happy with just committing 2 cards, uh, but of course it's a little suspicious because um, maybe there is a better card here. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to commit equipment or anything. Mm, yep, I'm going to overblock by three, which, as far as I know, is a pretty safe play. But, of course, one of Levi or one of uh, Dorinthia's cards that can really get around this is that Singing Steel Blade, because it's going to pump by one, 
and then probably search out something that pumps by three. So if you only overblock by three, singing can really, really punish you. Um, but of course, there's only two in the deck, and uh, you can't always play around every single one of these cards. So he does go ahead and go for the singing here. And uh, this can search him out, uh, ideally something like the, um, I believe it's called Iron Song Response, zero cost, pump by three, so that he can go over my six block and trigger Dorinthia and then let him swing again with that last resource. So back on my position here, I've got a Ivafidia and an Endless Maw in hand, which of course is a fantastic uh, two card hand. So because I've got the Arsenal Sink Below, I know that I can still block uh, a second attack here pretty comfortably just with the Sink Below. I'm going to lose my Arsenal, but of course denying Dorinthia a counter this early is exactly what you have to do. So he is going to buff it up to 7 now, which means I will take 1. We're just talking through here uh, some questions about priority on defense reactions. Of course, I wasn't actually going to uh, use a Sink Below here because um, I'd rather... Uh, I'd rather play it safe and make sure that his resource is gone on the next attack. So now we see that he comes at me again. And of course I've got the sink below here and I'm not going to sink because my hand already is an endless malt, which is a perfect card. And then a Ivafidia, right? So no reason to ever sink there. Um, even though normally you really like to use those effects to get closer to blood rush bellows. Um, so we're going to resolve the eye here. Uh, I believe I saw two red hungering slaughter beasts. So just spread those out. There's no reason to have, those two cards in hand. I've already got um, pretty good stock on the graveyard here. Um, so yeah, no reason to keep two reds side by side. Plus when you bottom those cards, like I said, it can get you closer to these stuff like Blood Rush Bellows. So debatable whether bottoming both of them was actually correct there. Um, but because I don't have an arsenal uh, and I am turning off Blood Debt this early, it is nice to know that there will be at least one attack on top. So um, against Cerinthia, once again, right, they don't want to block with cards in hand so that they can have any semblance of a threat. So there we see the equipment um, used already uh, just on the Endless Moss Swing, which when, they're, when their equipment takes a hit like this so early, it's fantastic because what this really means is, okay, when I do find Blood Rush like mid game, they are not going to have the same level of equipment block that they could to just tank the entire turn because already we're looking at Tom at 18. And in theory, right, a, a low roll on a Blood Rush tends to be Claw Claw into one attack for probably 18, 19, something like that. So he's already, in theory, lethal range. Um, he has a little bit more block in his equipment, of course, but I can present lethal in theory if I draw Blood Rush Bellows. So he's going to lead in here with a similar play as last game. This is a Steel Blade Supremacy coming out again um, with Dawn Blade. And, uh, of course, once again, doesn't have go again yet, but with him committing the Courage of Blade Hold, there's no way he doesn't have guaranteed go, go again in hand. He's absolutely going to be playing either another Singing Seal Blade or a Glint um, or a buff so that he can trigger ref Refraction Bolters, whatever it is. So it's really hard in these positions when you know that Dorinthia is going to come at you with such a strong attack and you don't have an Arsenal card because now the whole plan of Block 2, Play 2 can really fall apart because you don't have the ability to overblock with that extra card and still play off two cards because uh, you uh, only would have one left in hand, right? So we'll take this second to mention once again, um, this was the early days setup. Um, I know there's some glare on the cards. I am taking Hope Merchant's Hood in this game. Uh, might be able to see it. I'll fix all the glare stuff for next next game, I promise. And I also will add a Blood Deck counter and a Graveyard counter because... Uh, Right, the whole reason we're here is to learn Levi better, so I need to give us all those things. Um, so what we see here is that I am comfortable blocking with at least this one card, um, so I'm going to force him to at least commit something to this attack uh, so that it doesn't just hit for free. Um, so he is going to glint it. No attack is coming over the top yet, because I am blocking five, so here comes another card committed. I'm fine with this. He is going to pump it by three. So, of course, I don't have defense reactions. I'm going to be taking this hit. He now is going to draw another card with that singing steel blade. Or not singing, uh, with the steel blade supremacy. And I know he's going to swing in for another attack. So, this is just, unfortunately, one of those really big turns for Dorinthia um, that I don't have a lot of say in full blocking out. I had the ability to just commit that entire hand and take a bit of blood debt. But the other line of play already is kind of knowing that this turn can get out of hand so much so that it may just be a husk turn already. So 
as we see his next attack come out, he's already leading with that sharpened steel. Uh, and he's got the uh, buff from Steel Blade Supremacy, and he's got the buff from Out for Blood as well. So that card is coming in for, I believe, yeah, so Dawn Blade is coming in for 9 right now on this attack. So this is a really interesting position now, where I know that if I overblock by 3, or not overblock, but block for a total of 9, it does nothing, because he definitely, definitely has something left in the tank still, with a card in Arsenal, a card in hand. Um, there's the possibility of him just pump, pumping it over anyway. So then I have to make the judgment call of, if I'm not going to full block this, then what kind of return threat can I realistically have into him? Is it enough to the point where him having a Dottomly counter isn't such a big deal? Um, so I had to cut there for a sec because my cat actually jumped on the table in that moment. Um, so just thinking this through here, uh, it, is, it is a tough choice here because if I commit Husk and a card from hand, that's still only blocking 9, which you will probably push over anyway. So then it really becomes blocking with Husk and 2 cards from hand if I want to play super safe, but I believe that would put me at 3 blood debt right now, which is still me taking 3 damage, right? So I'm taking 3 damage either way, in theory, for both those lines, but one of them means he potentially gets a Dawnblade counter. Um, and so if I just go this other route, which is use the Husk for just life value, He's going to get the counter anyway, but now I'm preserving three cards, which opens up my ability to still have threat as well, and kind of stalls out the cards that he had in hand because he doesn't get to trigger um, Reprise. Um, so the return is unfortunately not that big of a hit. It is just the um, Hungering Slaughter Beast coming in for seven. But once again, I'm in that position where if I find a Blood Rush, I'm probably going to just tank it, tank the, the turn if I can, and uh, present lethal because Dorinthia has a hard time breaking over normally like 12 damage and it can be really hard if you just decide not to block any of it. So I'm still trying to do damage where I can because I've seen a pretty good amount of the deck right now uh, with the ops and uh, I know that the blood rush should be coming. So just coming in for seven and once again if he if he takes this kind of hit I'm really really happy with this. Uh, and he takes 6 damage on that, and I get to set up an arsenal here. And arsenal is really, like, untold value for Leviathan in this matchup. It can really win you a game to just have that extra card sitting there so that you can block on that critical moment. So, with that arsenal now set up, um, I wish I remembered, honestly, uh, what that arsenal is. Let me, let me check my notes, actually. Um, no, I don't have it in my notes. Not sure what the arsenal is. We'll, we'll probably see it. Uh, it might be a Boneyard Marauder, actually. I, I kind of feel it. Yeah, I think it's a Boneyard Marauder. Yep. So, then we look at uh, Tom's play here. He's got, of course, the Dream Dorinthia turn of being able to swing in with a go again, counter Dawnblade. So, that is a Dawnblade coming in for 6, uh, which is actually kind of good math for me, because if I decide to overblock by 3, it's only 3 cards out of my hand. I don't have to commit equipment. So... Knowing that my arsenal is a playable card that'll turn off Blood Debt, with that with it being a Boneyard Broader, this is the kind of turn where overlocking by three once again is opened up. This is what the arsenal's all about. I get to overblock by three in the mid game. Really, really strong ability here. Um, and I also have a Ghostly Visit in hand, and having that in the graveyard right now is going to be really, really strong because that just opens up the ability for playables that aren't cards in hand or an arsenal. Really, really strong this matchup. So right now, just uh, contemplating what I want to block with, what I want to keep in hand. Consideration being, I can try to get really greedy and block with the ghostly, roll scab skins, and then if I pitch a yellow, I believe that card is a beast within that I have left in hand, I can uh, potentially banish the ghostly and come in with that as well for a 10 damage turn um, off of two cards. So I want that line open. It's not... It's not great by any means, but it's something that I want to see uh, really if he can get over this attack. Because if he can, I may have to get really greedy to stay in the game here. But instead, he has what I would consider like a pretty mediocre response. He's going to deal me damage. Um, but he no longer has the ability to swing uh, Dawnblade again because he's out of resources because that overpower just costs so much. So he will keep the counter, but he doesn't gain another one. So with how that played out, 
I'm actually fine here to not go for the ultra greed route that kind of like Hail Mary play to win the game. Um, so, oh, looks like actually the card I kept wouldn't have let me done that anyway. I kept a red. Okay, okay. I take it all back. I kept a red, so I didn't have that line open to me anyway. Um, but by pitching the red dread screamer in, it, it's going to make my Hope Merchant's Hood better because I want those really high quality cards still in the deck. That's right. That's the line I went for. That is correct. No ultra greed. Come on, Ethan. Um, so here we go. Coming in for six, I'm going to lose this arsenal card, which, like I said, super valuable. But now we're in that spot where um, I can really probably tank a good turn from Tom. I can. My my life is at a point where um, he probably can't present lethal off four cards no matter what, because I'm at 13, and I still have one more block on the Scabskins. So no matter what he does here, if it, whether it be gain another counter... Um, or whatever he's going to do. I am very happy with life totals as long as my hand can present lethal. Because the more cards you take out of Dorinthia, the less scary she is. I mean, if she doesn't have that card in Arsenal, it's a big, big deal. If she doesn't have those, like, two cards in hand going into her turn, big, big deal. Less likely to have those attack reactions that'll end the game. So, on Declaration, uh, I'm going to use Hope Merchant Hood because my hand was really not doing what I wanted it to. Um, from the scenario I just mentioned, it wasn't a hand that was going to present uh, more than seven damage. I believe it was a Doomsday, Hell from Beyond Red, and then uh, I think it was a Barraging Beatdown and maybe something else. Something that something that wasn't quite good enough. So using Hope Merchants there because the Doomsday is really good here. I have the six Blood Debt to be able to cast it. But ideally, I want some other form of big attack in hand as well, and that's what was lacking with that hand. So I get to use Hope Merchants. I mean, if I can find Blood Rush, this is fantastic as well. Um, so we're going to go ahead and see what I draw with those three. And this is going to be a really, really rewarding use of Hope Merchants Hood. So what I do there, I keep the Doomsday, I drew into a Red Howl, which is not like super important, it's just a card I can go ahead and block with. But I also drew a Red Dread Screamer, which if you remember last turn, I pitched back into the deck, and a blue. So now the options are all open to me of at least Red Dread Screamer into Blasmophet, for sure. I can also go pretty greedy for the Ghostly Visit with that last floating uh, resource that'll be available after the Dread Screamer, and still swing Blasmophet. Um or potentially just arsenal the Doomsday and use it as a surprise attack later in the game. So this hand is really, really rewarding um, for me. I, I get a lot of options with this hand, but basically what I know is not going to happen is that I'm going to block. It's just, it's just not going to, not going to be what I do this turn. Um, I do have that one card that might as well just save me some life in the Howl from Beyond. I know that this is a position where Tom's most likely to use the Refraction Bolters, so I'm just making sure here that I can't really die out of nowhere. Um, so he's coming in for five, which is a lot of damage, but uh, I'm going to take it. Of course, he has to commit the Refraction Bolters there. Um, he has to pay another resource if he wants to attack with the Dawnblade, which can uh, give me, a, I guess, a little bit better of a read of what he might have here. And honestly, reading Dorinthia is really important in these mid-game situations where one wrong block can lose you the game. So by not blocking with the Howl from Beyond yet, I'm watching what he's spending his resources on. So because he spends one on the Braveforge Bracers, um, yes, it makes his Dawnblade come in for six, but now it tells me that if he's going to pump his card again, it's going to be specifically with the two cards he has in hand. So if we think about, like, worst case scenario, it's a red overpower. Red overpower would pump the attack by, um, what would it be, like six or seven? I don't quite know how much that card does. Um, but the other worst case scenario is being pump by four. Like a Singing Steel Blade into a uh, Iron Song Response would be a total of a four buff um, coming in. So what I need to do is at least block three damage total. Because if he pumps it up by four to ten, and I only block two with that Howl, I will die. So by throwing in the Scabskins here, it's extra protection that the other lines that would bring him to four don't work. And what we see in his hand here is actually another line that would get him to four, which is uh, the blue overpower. So blue overpower, I believe he does play it here. 
Um, that is another card that's going to pump him by four and leave me at one. But the, the important thing to remember here is I just need to get my attack turn off. I don't really need to protect my health right now. I just need another turn in the driver's seat. To be alive at one honestly means you played a very, very tight game. You're playing things <laughs> uh, with this kind of endgame state in mind. Uh, and that is what my hand is really going to really gonna let me unlock here. Is yes, I'll be at one. My turn's going to be so overwhelming that uh, I don't mind because my my return is going to be so high damage-wise that I'm going to take enough cards out of Dorinthia's hand to really never make her a threat again. So what we see here is exactly what I said. Um, yes, he's going to gain that extra Dawnblade counter, but who cares? We've got a great turn coming. So I'm going to roll Scabskins, and uh, look at that. It's only the second Scabskins roll of uh, the best of three here, and it's a second one, unfortunate, but of course I'm going to use Gambler's Gloves here, because uh, you never let a one go through, I mean, you'd lose, um, and I do get rewarded here with double action points, so this is fan-freaking-tastic. The one thing that can go wrong is I can um, whiff on this Banish, I believe, so unfortunately I do just lose if I whiff on the Banish, but you can't, you can't have every out as Levi, so I believe it's a miss-miss hit, thank freaking goodness. Um, so that means my action points are back up to effectively two because the Dread Screamer has the go again. And now I get the play I was talking about where I can go Dread Screamer into that Ghostly into the uh, Doomsday Summon of Blasmafet, which means I will be presenting 16 damage off a three card hand. What the heck, Levia? You are crazy, girl. And this is the kind of position that Dorinthia is just never going to come back from. 16 damage. When Dorinthia is out of block, uh, off a three card hand, where I was able to put myself down to one, um, plus the fact that I'm going to have Blasma fed out as just wonderful insurance that I don't with Blood Debt, I really, really love the position I'm in. So, unfortunately, Tom, in a very tough spot here. Uh, but we, you know, we, we set this up. This is what we wanted to do. And we do see the beauty of Hope Merchants, right? I uh, Hope Merchants would just give me the... Uh, or Arcanite Skullcap would just give me the extra life, but Hope Merchants gave me this entire play. So that's why I, I just really love that card. So we see him full blocking the 6. If he takes the 4 here, I don't think he's expecting 6 damage. He's probably just expecting the uh, Mandible Claw for a 3. Uh, but there we go, Blasmavet coming in. He has to full block this. Or, uh, yeah, because he just doesn't have the equipment left now. So, um, yeah, love this position, because now he's going to skip his entire turn, lose the Dawnblade counters, and he goes back to me. Fantastic turn for Leviah right here. Gotta love those turns. Um, Blitz is just such a tight game. When you pull off a turn like that, you, you really should win. The one issue now is, when you cast Doomsday, I almost wish it would just banish itself, because it is a miss in Graveyard. The Ghostly is another miss in Graveyard, and I believe I have one more miss in Graveyard. So... I do actually have the potential to just whiff on the Banish 3 if I go for it, but Blasmfet will always turn it off. What I check for now, though, is the fact that uh, we've kind of reset the game to the point where I probably never lose. Um, what can happen, of course, would be I swing with a Mandible Claw, and he has the Super Blade Shunt, so I'm never going to go for that. Um, however, I'm playing a little bit... A little bit fast on this one. I have a Writhing Beast Hulk in hand, and I'm thinking that can get me potential lethal right now um, because he's out of equipment block. It can also trim the graveyard because if I do hit exactly the three whiffs, I mean, I do lose, but if I just swing with Blasma Fett, because my, my hand can't really push more than three damage or six damage, if I just swing with Blasma Fett, then it gives him a chance to block to play to, um, which, I mean, honestly, that's that's fine. I feel like that's just the safer line, but I'm talking through it here about how the chances are um, honestly pretty favorable to not miss. I'd have to lose three 50-50s, right? So thinking about it, safer play was definitely Blasmfet, but at the same time, I could just win the game if the Writhing Beast Hulk hits. And if the Rising Beast Hulk uh, hits any of these non-sixes, then I'm just set up for like an inevitability here, where Blasm Fett will just always win the game off value. So, I do play the Rising Beast Hulk. I'm not going to get greedy play that Howl from beyond first, because I don't want to make my misses more likely. Um, so, you know, this is a debatable play. You could definitely just swing with the Blasm Fett here. 
but potential lethal. A little too good to pass up. Um, plus, I had a cushion of a game, right? We're playing a best of three, so I wanted to try, you know, some different lines and see what would happen. So uh, here we go. I do hit um, that, so in my head I'm thinking, okay, unless he has a four block, this is probably game. And I do trim a miss, so I'm all set up to never miss on Blood Dead again, as long as I don't put a non-six in the yard. So he does have the sink below, so that means it's not lethal, but he is going to drop down to the point where, once again, Reckless Swing can win me the game. And if we look at what I've seen this game cards-wise, it's been such a weird game. I've seen zero Blood Rush. Zero. They were probably already at the bottom, and then I hope Merchants, and they probably went back to the bottom. Um, I also haven't seen a Reckless Swing yet, and the game, uh, the deck is actually really slim at this point. This has been a long, long game. I believe it's been uh, eight or nine rounds total. Um, so I know that some of these power cards have to be coming up, and uh, sure enough, that uh, that is what might end up happening here. So Tom was able to keep three cards here. He does have a nourishing, which he thinks is probably game over, but one of the beauties, like I mentioned very early on, about having defense reactions in your deck is that if you can set, up, set them up in Arsenal, you can really, really get unlimited value from them. So I do have a Fate for Scene in Arsenal right now. And uh, I get to block, of course, go to Reaction. And that is that. I will not lose Nourishing, thank goodness. Um, that's the kind of thing where Jorinthia can play really greedy trying to go for those plays. But you know you have the Defense Reaction set up, and of course they, they don't. So he's looking at the other card in hand, which is a Route, and thinking the other line could have been just Swing and Dawnblade, and then Route for Lethal. But of course, if he goes for that, then I, I'm just going to overblock heavy anyway, because I don't need all these cards in hand. So uh, I'm going to lead now with Convulsions. This is a great card when you do have Misses in Grave, because even if this one doesn't hit, you're going to then guarantee whatever the next thing is to hit. So I'm playing the blue Convulsions now. It is going to hit, which is great, but look at that. It is, it is trimming those non-sixes as well. So that is going to be plus one on the next tag action card and dominate. And then, of course, that last card in hand is the lovely Boneyard Marauder. Absolutely love that card in Levi. And, of course, that means it's coming in for seven with dominate. That is two dominate attacks back to back. Pretty much impossible for Tom to um, to, to not die here. It, it's, it's, it's locked. And sure enough, that's what we see happen. And uh, that is a 2-0 for Levi. Hope you all enjoyed. And reminder, two more coming this week.